I'm Rupert Sheldrake. I'm a biologist and I'm the author of several books, including Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work, the most recent one. Let's talk about Ways to Go Beyond. What led you to start writing it? I'm interested in science because I'm a scientist. I'm also interested in a range of spiritual practices because I do them myself. And I lived in India for seven years. And um, so I've, I've been learned a lot when I was there of different kinds of practices. So I've written two books, actually. The first sort is called Science and Spiritual Practices and Ways to Go Beyond is a sequel, a kind of culmination of this project. Um, and in the book, I discuss seven different spiritual practices which can lead to us feeling more connected uh, with something greater than ourselves. That's what spiritual practices do. Um, and the first chapter is on sports, which many people find surprising, but um, is, I think, the way in which most people in modern Britain achieve some state of going beyond themselves, a, a kind of altered state of consciousness. And one of the things about participating in sports is that it completely shuts down the default mode network, that region of the brain that's to do with the chattering mind, the internal dialogue. Meditation is also about shutting down the default mode network, but sports work faster. You know, if you're, uh, as one friend of mine who's a mountaineer said, you know, by the time he's 50 feet up a rock face, he was completely in the present. Um, and if you're in the middle of a football game, you're totally in the present. If you're skiing downhill at 60 miles an hour, you go around a corner, there's an obstacle in the way, you have to be totally in the present. And I think that's one reason that extreme sports uh, and dangerous sports are so popular today, because they make people totally in the present. Uh, if your concentration lapses for a second or two, you're dead. So I think sports are one kind of spiritual practice. Many people do them because they feel they get in the flow, you know, in a sense of being part of a flow greater than just themselves. The second uh, practice I discuss is learning from animals. And again, most people don't think of that as a spiritual practice. Um, but one of the points of spiritual practices is coming into the present. As I said, the default mode network takes us into this constant chattering mind, anxiety, fears, um, judgments, fantasies, and so on. Um, but animals don't have that problem. Uh, if a cat's purring because you're stroking it, it's sitting contentedly on your lap, it's totally in the present. And so we can learn from animals uh, quite a few different things, but one of them is being in the present. So can you, can you connect being in the present to what you earlier said about going beyond, which is being conscious of something greater or bigger or being involved in something larger than you are? Well, I think it's a common experience that if you come completely into the present, then the only way you can feel the presence of a greater consciousness is in the present. And um, just being in the present, fully in the present, is for most people a kind of spiritual experience. All mystical experiences are about being completely present. And uh, our normal state of mind is discursive chatter. You know, we're thinking about what we do next or what we ought to have done yesterday and that kind of thing. So this is constant internal chatter that always takes us away from the present. I once saw a Game Boy advert on the tube and it said, wherever you are, be somewhere else. And you know, there's the exact opposite of the principle of be here now, which is a key feature of spiritual practices. Next is fasting. And fasting isn't in itself uh, bringing you into the present, um, but what it's doing is clearing the mind and body. I mean, fasting is present in all religions. It's also done for health reasons in a purely secular context. And uh, when you fast, the levels of so-called ketone bodies go up in your blood, particularly beta-hydroxybutyric acid, uh, BHB, which is very closely related to, to gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA, which is the main neurotransmitter in the brain, and GBH, gamma uh, GHB, gamma hydroxybutyric acid, these are neurotransmitters. So fasting is psychoactive and um, people who fast find that their mind often becomes clearer, their dreams more vivid. So fasting is a way of actually changing your mind um, in a way that's free. In fact, not only free, you actually save money um, and um, it changes your whole sense of reality, the 
time of days open up, it's easier to meditate, easier to pray. Uh, that's why it's been part of spiritual practices in all religious traditions. The next chapter is on psychedelics and cannabis, because I think for many people in the modern world, um, they provide a spiritual opening, a kind of rite of passage. For a lot of young people, taking a psychedelic is opens a realm of consciousness they didn't know existed. It certainly had that effect on me when I first took LSD in 1970. Um, and the, um, I think psychedelics uh, in some cultures are used shamanically, like ayahuasca in the Amazon, mushrooms in Mexico, iboga in West Africa, um, as part of a kind of rites of passage and moving into a different state of being. So I think they're playing a major spiritual role in the modern world, actually, and that's why I have a chapter on this subject. Um, and then I discuss prayer, which is the, uh, obviously more mainstream than learning from animals or even fasting. I mean, lots of people pray. Uh, what's going on when you're praying? There's a lot of studies that show, scientific studies, that show that people who pray are generally speaking happier, healthier, and live longer than those that don't. Um, and you could say this is just a kind of placebo effect, um, but even if you do say that, then um, placebo effects work. You know, it's the best documented of all effects in medicine. It happens in every kind of drug or surgical trial. You get placebo effects. And so anything that enhances placebo effects is going to work better than something that doesn't. And it may be much more than that. And for people who pray, there's a, often a sense of connection with a greater realm of consciousness. Um, and I pray myself. All these practices are things I do myself. So I'm, I'm, uh, they're all ones that I personally think work, or at least work for me. Then I have a, a, a whole chapter on holy days and festivals, which are present in all religious traditions and indeed secular traditions. And the whole point of holy days and festivals is that holy days are holidays. I mean, it's the same word, basically. Um, and a holiday, for there to be a holy day, it has to be a holiday, because it has to be a day when you're not working to celebrate it. And the whole point of holy days and festivals is that everyone, or nearly everyone, has a holiday at the same time, so you can celebrate together. Um, if you have a 24-7 culture where people are given random times off. They work on Saturdays and Sundays and on Christmas Day and Boxing Day and that kind of thing. They're given a sort of next Tuesday off instead. In terms of time, they may get the same time off, but the quality of the time is much less because everyone's working then. There's, it completely loses this sense of collective celebration, which is very important for us all. And I think that's one reason why summer festivals have, as it were, reinvented the traditional festival, which used to happen in the Middle Ages in England. The, the Puritans weren't very keen on them, so a lot of them were suppressed. Uh, but I think they've been reinvented in the form of summer music festivals, and to some degree in the form of how the light gets in, <laughs> uh, which only work because people are free to come at the same time. and, and um, and then I, the, I have a chapter on um, cultivating virtues, avoiding vices, and being kind. You know, there's a kind of morality which is important in all these things, because if it's just a matter of feeling good through taking psychedelics or doing yoga or something, then it's not necessarily helping anyone else. So it could be seen as a purely spiritual, a purely selfish practice rather than spiritual. The scientific community hasn't necessarily welcomed what you've had to say as scientific. Do you want to be recognised as scientific? Do you think the modern scientific community is unwilling to look beyond its own boundaries? At the moment, the official scientific worldview is dominated by the philosophy of mechanistic materialism. The doctrine that nature's dead, nature's inanimate, animals and plants are machines, and so are we. Um, that mind's nothing but the brain that evolution is purposeless. This is the belief system that dominates modern science. And I think it's played a part in creating the ecological crisis. And so it's not just an intellectual belief system. And I think it's profoundly mistaken. And that's why a lot of my scientific work has been trying to 
go beyond that limited worldview. My book, The Science Delusion, looks at the ten principal assumptions of mechanistic materialism and shows that they're basically not very scientific, they're just assumptions. And if we turn those assumptions into questions, we can test them scientifically, um, then science can move on. It's by closing down questioning that science gets stuck. And uh, so some people who are great believers in mechanistic materialism, usually militant atheists are the people who've got the biggest investment in this worldview, get very angry at what I'm doing and attack it and say it's pseudoscience and so forth. Um, but um, there are a lot of people in the scientific world who agree with me that we need to move on. Um, that there's a growing movement, for example, in philosophy of mind of panpsychism, the idea that there's a kind of mind or consciousness throughout nature. We don't just live in a dead, inanimate, mechanistic universe, that nature is more like an organism than a machine. And so um, there are many people in the scientific world who actually want this kind of change to happen. I'm not the only person advocating it. I may be one of the ones who's more in the public eye than others, and it's partly because I've got nothing to lose. I, I say what I think. Whereas the scientific world is full of people who are kind of closet supporters of a change towards a more animistic or panpsychist view of nature, a more holistic approach to science. Most of them keep quiet because they don't want to lose their jobs or not get their next grant application renewed or spoil their chance of a better postdoc than they've got at the moment. Uh, so many of them keep quiet. I, I, I'm constantly approached by scientists I meet under clandestine circumstances uh, uh, who uh, tell me how much they too want science to change, but they can't say so to their colleagues. And so it's certainly not the case that the entire scientific community is opposed to changing from mechanistic materialism. A lot of people would love this change to happen, and it is actually happening. There's a move towards panpsychism I think partly through people taking psychedelics, it often leads to people shifting their worldview from extreme mechanistic materialism to something more uh, panpsychist. Well, if you can also prove that people who are playing sport are moving towards that, then yeah, you might be onto a winner there, I think. I think it's harder, for most people playing sports, it's harder to get that panpsychist dimension, but I think, I think that might be possible, yes. Um, when was the last time you played Sunday League? <laughs> Um, I have never played Sunday League. <laughs> For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.